G'day, Guitar Wankers. Welcome to another Guitar Wank podcast. Thank you for joining us. You're still with us. Fantastic. I'm excited. I'm happy. Whoa, how rude. Oh, I can't get that now. Um, <laughs> hi, my name's Troy McCubbin. I'm your host. You have no say in it. This is Guitar Wank Podcast, episode 216. That's 216. How many hours is that? That's a shitload of hours that we, you and I will never get back. Or oh, Bruce and Scott will never get those hours back. But, you know, what are you going to do? Because we're, uh, we're in coronavirus 2020. Uh, shit has hit the fan. And, um, yeah, what are you going to do? It's uh, crazy times, ladies and gentlemen. So crazy times calls for crazy measures. So this is another amazing Guitar Wing podcast with uh, superstar guest. You may know him from Mork and Mindy. Uh, you may know him from uh, many other TV shows. Dave Stryker, ladies and gentlemen. Dave Stryker is going to be on the show. Uh, he wasn't on Mork and Mindy, but he is a great guitar player from New York. All, th- all these New York cats are coming on the show now. It's like they've got nothing better to do than just sit around and fucking go on podcasts. Well, good on you, Dave. We're stoked to have you, mate. Really awesome to have you on the show. Dave, if you don't know Dave Stryker, he's always got number one albums in the jazz world. So uh, fucking check him out. Uh, I'm going to play a track after my little intro. Little intro. And, um, yeah, check it out. Dave's Dave's badass. He kicks ass. And uh, I really, really dug meeting him and, uh, and chatting away. It was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah. Sit back and enjoy the show with Dave and Bruce. Scotty couldn't be with us on this one, but uh, uh, I think he was watching Breaking Bad or something. I don't know what he was doing. He was teaching, I think. But anyway, now remember, if I haven't told you this, I have told you a hundred times, please go to guitarwank.com, check out the new website, give us the thumbs up. Um, what was it? Go to iTunes, or iTunes, wherever you listen to us, give us a, give us a, a review or a thumbs up or something positive back so we can use that against the internet social media world to get more listeners and to annoy more people that's really what we're trying to do here to piss off more people if we can um yeah so that's what we're going to do so do that go to guitarwank.com sign up on guitarwank.com so you don't miss an episode for god's sakes you don't want to miss an episode i mean shit you know what else what else would you do so uh, you can go there also patreon members oh my god if you are a patreon member how do i become a patreon member troy go to guitarwank.com there's uh, a link at the top which take you straight there to the guitarwank patreon page and you can sign up for a dollar a day no it's a dollar a month actually i should make it a dollar a day no a dollar a month which is nothing that's like nothing it's not even a cup of coffee. All right, so a dollar a day up to $3 a day or even more if you want to. Not a day, I mean a month, you know what I mean. But anyway, you get these amazing videos of Bruce and it's just really supporting Guitar Wank, keeping us off the streets and uh, keeping, keeping our drug habits. Uh, yeah, all the above. You get the gist. It's just supporting your local musicians um so yeah so you could do that what else we got bruce live at five you got to check out grumps if you're not doing that you should you can go back and watch all 28 seasons of grumps tv which is all fantastic but uh yeah all right well let's keep it short a short intro today troy how what do you reckon yeah let's do it all right guys um be safe what whatever shit you're going through just hang in there and uh we're sending lots of love and good thoughts and best wishes because it is a fucking tough time right now for a lot of people and all in all seriousness uh this is where we need to support each other and just uh, wear a fucking mask is a start and um yeah let's just let's get through this shit i want to get through this shit and get back to gigging and playing and hanging out and drinking and not alone <laughs> as much all right you know what i mean right you get it let's get through this shit 
<laughs> all right. Uh, we'll talk to you guys all next episode. Sit back and enjoy the amazing Dave Stryker. I think he should have his own radio show. He's got the big radio voice happening. <laughs> I might even emphasize it a little bit more with plugins, Dave. Uh, but yeah, a real pleasure, mate. Thanks, Dave. And uh, I'm going to play a couple of tracks from Dave throughout this episode. And uh, but check him out. Google him and. Uh, I- I'm um, awesome player. Awesome bloke, awesome player. Good stuff. And you can go to DaveStriker.com like everyone else, you know. Check it out. All right, guys, until next week, we'll catch you all later and check out this next track by Dave Striker.
Okay. Okay, so it's you. It's all right. We go through this every time as well. <laughs> it's all good. Should be down below on the bottom that mute button. Yeah, that's all on. Oh, oh there you go. I we, hear we, you now. we hear you now. All righty. All righty. Right. Well, okay, how are we doing so far? What did I do? Spill my something on myself here? Oh, you man? got a drinking problem, Dave. <laughs> this is my kind of man. Oh, yeah. He's, 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 he's already into it. Bad. Yeah, he's going to change for us and everything. Right? <laughs> is you, this going to be audio or ju just audio? I, it'll probably mostly be audio. Yeah, but we just. May, we may put a little bit of a video, like up on Facebook or something, you know. I hope he's putting on a guitar yeah, wank t shirt. Yeah. If I had one, I would. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, let's, let's try again. All right, that looks good. Whoa, Jazz. Oh, damn, you now you look too good. All right. All right, cats. How you guys doing? Good. Yeah, doing good. Dave, Troy, welcome. Thank you. Well, where are you where are you from, Troy? I mean, where are you right? Uh, you know, videoing from or whatever. I'm. You call this. I'm in. Uh, I'm. Well, I'm in North North Hollywood, Los Angeles. But yeah, the accent will give me away. I'm Australian, obviously. Yeah. I noticed the um, North Hollywood accent you have. <laughs> right? Yeah. I oh. used to live in North Hollywood. Oh, whereabouts? I lived on Lancashire and Magnolia. I'm on Lancashire and Burbank. Yep. Yeah. So but right this there. was many, many moons ago. This was oh, in. And it's changed so much since then. Wow. I was. This was, believe it or not, this was back in the. You know, the Billy Rogers days, been 78 to 80, I was oh, out there. Oh, wow. This must have been the hood back then, right? Yeah. First place I lived was on Whipple. Yeah. And had an apartment on Whipple, which was a liter just like four blocks from Dante's. So I got to see <laughs> Joe Pass and, and Lenny Bro down there and, you know, a lot of cool people. Oh, wow. And I actually saw you, Bruce, one time at some club... Was it Dante's or was it Carmelo's? No, it was like a small club somewhere. Right. Uh, and I think you were playing with uh, Richie Cole. Ah. Yeah, oh, I, yeah, I don't think... Would have been Carmelo's or... Uh, or... It might have, like some region room or... There was... Uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but um, you didn't sound that good, so it wasn't that memorable. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> hey, we should, uh, in, Bruce. You should introduce Dave. Dave, you got uh, you got a good radio voice going on there, mate. Yeah, Dave. Dave. Dave's got it going, man. You know, he lives in a bunker, obviously. You know, it's a basement, um, undisclosed location. He's in the CIA, but you know, he's a really good guitar player for a spy. So uh, <laughs> that's right, and. Uh, you know, we can, uh, we don't want to really get into that because, you know. Yeah, if you tell us, you have to kill us. I'd have to kill you, and I, I you know, I really don't want right, to. Yeah, you know. All right, well, introduce Bruce. Hey, Dave, uh, Dave Stryker, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure everybody who listens to this thing knows him already. But if not, uh, he comes from the Midwest, and he's been playing. He's always got a number one record out. You know, that's why they all know about him. And, uh. He's a burning player. I've known him for a long time, and he teaches at a few different colleges. And damn, man, he's what we all want to be when we grow up. <laughs> Bruce, you're you're too kind, my friend. Well, oh, well, you should catch me on a nice day. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously your career was going great, and now you're on guitar wing. Yeah, no, so. this is the end of it, though, Dave. You know, I don't think you're going to see number one for a while again. You know. Well, that was that was a nice. Uh, I had a nice, a nice little run last summer about this time, actually, so, with one of my records. I don't, I don't see that, you know, necessarily happening again. But everything kind of fell into place, and it was nice, yeah. nice while, it, nice while it lasted. Nope. Yeah, well, you know, records and gigs and all that stuff. Who knows what's going to happen next? You know, we're going to yeah. have something new. You know what I mean? Well, I, you know, I've always said, you know, you know, if you stick around it, stick in this business long enough, Bruce, and keep working hard, pay your dues, eventually you can make hundreds, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'm still hey, working on that. Hey, yeah. that the truth. Of what though? <laughs> in fact, in fact, I'm I'm a hundred air. <laughs> Whoa, man, he's made it. He's done it. Uh, he, look, he obviously spent it on a lot of equipment because look at all them guitars in the background. Man. Yeah. yeah. T-shirts and uh, guitars. Yeah, well, you know, 
So you ready for the NAM show then? I have not been to the NAM show. Do you go to that? Ever been to the NAM show and you lived here? I went there one time, like in 1978. I remember it was, uh, I, I did go there and like the many, many moons ago. And it was, uh, I remember seeing Jocko Pistorius walking around. You know, uh, my memory is, is in like a going up to somebody's hotel room. And I think it was Joe DiOrio's. And, and Jocko was walking down the hall, dragging his Fender bass, just like no case, just dragging it down the, the hallway. And then he went in and sat in with Joe DiOrio. Wow. Uh, and there was like, you know, 20 guitar players in there. Yeah. It's a long time ago. Damn, yeah. it, that must have went go. When did the NAM start? Oh, long time ago. Really? It's been going that long? I think my first NAM was around then, maybe a little before that. Yeah, and it, it had been going for a while by then. Yeah, it wasn't big like it was. It was just kind of like down at the bottom of the conventions. Yeah, even in the convention center for a while, it was in. It was in L.A. convention center, right? Los yeah, in downtown. It was somewhere else too, down yeah. in Orange County. Wow. And Dave, you're coming from us from whereabouts? You're in New York, or where are you at? I live in I live um, about 14 miles uh, west of New York City in a town called West Orange, New Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep. and I've been here. I was in. Uh, I'm originally from Omaha, as uh, as Bruce was mentioning, uh, and uh, it's a town that's like. The next big town, if, if you're coming east from New York, you got Chicago, then, you know, Omaha would be the next, you know, big town. <laughs> don't, don't laugh. Uh, and if you go three hours south, you got Kansas City. But Is Omaha uh, Irish? <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was a uh, uh, lot of people think, you know, Omaha, like, you know, I was out, you know, with throwing bales of hay up on the wagon and stuff but you know it wasn't quite like that it was actually a a, a, a you know pretty decent sized uh, town and uh, it, like it like any small town it had um uh you know a, a good share of good musicians you know a lot that you would never hear of but you know uh there was a, there was a fair amount of good musicians there um that you know it was it was a good place to grow up uh uh and I ended up leaving there after, you know, got into a, I was in a good, one of the good bands in town, you know, all through high school. And, and, uh, we had a gig. I remember coming out of high school at the Hilton where we would play six nights a week for six weeks at a shot. And the first two sets would be standards like Satin Doll and Girl from Ipanema. And the last two sets would be top 40. And so, you know, got to, got to play a lot. And then, Went out, moved out to L.A. for a couple of years because a couple of the musicians from Omaha that I had kind of started hanging out with, uh, one guy was named John Maller. Did you ever know him, Bruce? Uh, yeah. yeah, he was a piano player, organist, excellent player. And then the other guy was a guy named Billy Rogers, who I know you know, Bruce. Really dynamite player, and he was kind of like a, you know, big big hero to me, uh when I was in high school, he was playing with the Crusaders, and he was like a real fiery player that you know kind of oh, played. Man, that guy was unbelievable. He yeah, was he played like he like he a savant. Play. The shit just flew out of him. Man. Yeah. So anyway, I ended up going out there uh, for a couple of years, and um, where Bruce, where you, where were you at that time? Were I you was in San Francisco then? Yeah. And didn't I meet you? Billy came up and played some gigs with me up there. Didn't I, I seem to remember playing with you and Billy or hanging with you and Billy up there at some point. I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's... Um, I mean, I could, it could, you know, I do remember, I mean, Billy came up and, you know, those guitar clusterfuck gigs that people put together, you know, they put a bunch of guitar players together. Right. Expect music to happen. Uh, <laughs> um, Billy did a couple of those with me up in San Francisco, I remember. And I remember hanging with him in L.A. too. And yeah, he was a guy. You know, he was you know coming out of George Benson. You know, when when he was twenty years old. And, oh wow! And, and 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 but he, you know, had his own thing. And and unfortunately, he had a drug problem his whole life. And uh, he he let he was succumbed to an overdose in in San Francisco around nineteen seventy eight. He was only thirty seven. Oh damn! So yeah, I lost him too soon. But um, you know, it was very inspiring for me to 
to hear a guy like that, knowing he's from, he's from Omaha. And there used to, when I was in LA, there was a Jimmy Smith Supper Club. They had a place in uh, out in the valley. And uh, did you ever go there, Bruce? Supper Club? Jimmy Smith Supper Club? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So so the, you know it. I would hang out there. They had a jam session on Monday nights, and um, I would go every Monday. And Jimmy had a, a Leslie on each end of the room. It was a small club. I would say it's about 25 feet by 20 feet. And he had a Leslie on each end of the club, and then, you know, a little stage with a, a mirror over the uh, B3. And uh, it was rocking. It was a good time. So I, I got to uh, met, met a lot of people there, and I, I remember, you know, I'd be playing and thought I was doing pretty good, and I would feel a tap on my shoulder and it would be Billy had walked in the back of the club, you know, with the, yeah. Hey man, can I play a couple notes? <laughs> you know, and then I'd end up handing him my guitar and, you know, he'd blow the roof off the place. So it was, it was a humbling experience, but I ended up there for a couple of years and then I came to New York and, um, been here ever since i used to live in new york then brooklyn and now i'm out here that's a long way to answer that question where i'm where, <laughs> where <laughs> Wait, why did you leave los angeles um did you get a gig? I, I i had uh a buddy that in that band i was telling you about uh was a good good tenor player jorge nila he he went to a new he when we both left in uh the same time he went to manhattan new york and i went to la and um, I decided to go visit um, him in New York. So I had a, I drove. <laughs> I, drove. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> yeah. I drove my car, uh, stopped in Omaha, and then continued on uh, and drove and was going to stay a couple weeks and check it out. And I ended up staying four months. You know, when we're younger, we can do whatever we want, right? Yeah. And, um, it was like I re- immediately kind of saw that I had made a instead of making a left, I should have made a right when I left Omaha. I was, you know, I was I went out to you know because it was you know I I had a, a you know one of those eureka moments. I'm sitting at at uh, the Tin Palace in in New York City at about th- two in the morning, and George Coleman is playing with Al Foster on drums and Harold Mayburn, and they're playing Cherokee, you know, just burning, and I'm like. I should be here. This is <laughs> this is happening, and you know all these little clubs and jam sessions. So I went back out. Believe it or not, I drove back to L.A. <laughs> and uh, the things we do. Yeah, and, get up. And I played in a in a funk band uh, for the summer, save up some money, and um, and then moved like the beginning of. Uh, you know, the end of around 1980, I moved moved uh, back, moved to just to uh, New York. And m- my buddy had got me apartment in his building for 150 a month, uh, an efficiency <laughs> apartment in 99th and 3rd Avenue. Wow. And it was a great time back then. A lot of jam sessions and lofts and things like that. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it was a great, great experience. And I guess L.A. just didn't have that kind of a scene like there was a massive difference between obvious differences between new york and la but new york had more of a jazz scene per se well or- yeah they had you know the there was great some great players uh there was a, a jam session in, in in hollywood called pippies do you remember that one bruce yeah place called pippies henry franklin was there and uh i used to go to that and i i got a gig with a a uh, the Dell and the Sensations, which was like a um, Caribbean band, <laughs> and I played with them for a while. And then I had a, I got a gig with uh, I was just thinking about this today. A club, uh, was, I think it was called Stage One, and uh, with the Eddie Burrell Trio, I got an organ trio gig somehow, and uh, played there a little bit, and worked at a, a Pier One. Imports on yeah, Hollywood, on Hollywood players on Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, it's a funny story. I was let's just say you know I was working at Pier One. I think they went out of business, so I can say this now. But <laughs> let's just say that 
my apartment had a lot of furnishings. <laughs> from, was well furnished from from Pier working at Pier One, and uh, but it was cool. You know, I I remember riding my bike. You know, from uh, over there, and I was in uh, like I said, Lancashire and Magnolia, and it was cool. Um, and working there, and when I left. Uh, decided to quit there uh I remember the manager um one of the other workers said you know I can't believe Dave is leaving Pier 1 and the, and the manager said Dave is Pier 1 <laughs> 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 so you were so demoing a lot of the uh, the furnitures I could have you know I could have been Pier 1 I Yeah you you know Pier I, 1 and a half at least I know, know I 1.5 yeah. but I uh I guess you know the the music was still calling so um yeah when i came to new york it was it was uh i had met at at jimmy smith's supper club i had met jack mcduff and he said if you come to if you come to new york uh come come look me up so so i went up to the lickety split lounge in in harlem and sat in with uh, jack and uh ended up getting the gig with him which was which was great man you know uh because Jack had previously had George Benson, Pat Martino, Grant Green, Billy Rogers. Um, and so when I got in the band, he finally got a good guitar player. He was, you know, he was, very, he was very happy about that. Um, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce, you play with him too, right? Yeah, I did too. You know, he, so you know he, he, We all got some great McDuff stories. Oh, yeah. uh, but I... Uh, uh, and so held it for those people who don't know what what was his background because he obviously had all these great well, guitar players coming through. Well, you know, I or, mean, great organ player, great yeah. organ player. Okay, so like you know, I mean, most people probably who listen to the show know about the tradition of you know the organ, the Hammond organ type bands. You know, the, the bluesier side of jazz where it's usually good, the rhythm sections good uh, organ, guitar, and drums, not piano, bass, and drums. You know, and then. A lot of guitar players. We all come through that as a as a uh, training ground in many ways. It's just a it's a it's a setting that we all learn to play in. It's really blues based, and the the, the organ players are generally based from in the church first, you know. So there's a lot of that, and it's a very powerful sound and really big. And you got to learn to kind of cut through and still support it, and uh, learn to work with a Every organ player is a genius. I mean, you got to understand that these guys, they're walking bass, they're playing, you know, solos and, and harmony, and they're pulling draw bars. And everyone I've ever known pretty much sings and is an entertainer. And, you know, is, I mean, they're just these like amazing one man phenomena, you know, and you're just dealing with these humans that are just, you have to figure out a way to fit in with what they're going. And they, they generally have huge egos too, as well they should, because they're badass motherfuckers. I mean, you know, they're the whole thing, and so it's a really great training ground for a guitar player. To yeah, learn, I, I felt to, pump, to fit in, to get a sound, to you know, like to, and also the time is always a little bit loosey goosey because the guy's doing so much shit, and just the sound of the instrument's like a big harmonica, really, you know, and and so you're just dealing with this kind of like wave you know what i mean wow and so it's just uh i mean and george benson all those early george benson records with lonnie smith you know i mean there's great records with jack mcduff too that george made mm -hmm. and a lot of great youtube i mean and you know but we all kind of st i guess jimmy smith is kind of the starting point of that you know Right, with, with either Kenny Burrell or or that record he made with Wes. Well, how right. old how old was this guy when you when you guys were coming through? Because they obviously had these cats. How long how long earlier before? Well, the, in the sixties, the organ got very popular, and like in all all the black clubs uh, uh, had had a lot of them actually had Hammond B threes in the clubs and jukeboxes and some of these guys like mcduff would have uh hits on these in the black clubs in the jukeboxes like rock candy and a real good and um you know it was, it was a it was a real nice scene and I, everything that you know I, I i i totally agree with everything bruce said just now but it was um 
you know, there's a there's a handful of them, and this this is so the '60s was, uh, and then into the '70s, and uh, so I got to, got in there with with Jack towards the end of that that era, and I was lucky because the drummer was a guy named Joe Dukes, who was a fantastic uh, drummer, and those two guys were kind of like a a real team. So I like yeah, like Bruce said, you know, it was a, a real training ground. A lot of a lot of guitar players only lasted a gig or two because it was. Uh, they, Jack was also not afraid to tell you what he thought of your playing, and <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't, as we say in these 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 days, so politically correct. No, I, no. I remember my one of my first gigs. I, you know, they, I was playing, and uh, the, one of the first gigs we played was we. And here we go again. We drove from New York, Harlem, to play at Marla's Memory Lane in L.A. Ooh, in L.A. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and the car, and we had like maybe two gigs. You know, Jack would literally sometimes uh, get out and uh, be on the phone, you know, at the phone booth with his pad and a, and a yellow pages, you know, booking gigs while we were out there. It was out. But a lot of shitty motels, you know, it was it was um, what they call paying dues. It was really paying dues. And it was being on the road, literally rubber on the road. And, but we, we got... The truck broke down, like in Philly or something. And then we, now we're we had to start Friday night at Marla's Memory Lane, and and by the time the truck got fixed, we had to drive straight through, and we got to Marla's Memory Lane on Friday night at ten o'clock. We started at nine, and a lot of black folks are all there, you know, not dressed up and ready to hear Jack McDuff, and we're pushing the Leslie through. Excuse us, you know, pushing the Leslie through. This is my first gig. And he, Jack takes my little polytone mini brute and puts it on his Leslie's, <laughs> and it's this far from his from his ear. This is my first gig, and you know I'm a little nervous anyway. But you know I was, I'd been listening to that kind of music for a long time, so I was, you know, I, I knew kind of knew what I was doing somewhat. But then I just remember the next day we're we're uh, driving somewhere else to the next gig, and uh, I'm in the front seat, and and I'm just waiting, you know, and he's a striker. What kind of sound is that you're getting on that guitar? Sounds like T-Bone Walker. Maybe you like that. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, it's like, your sound sucks. <laughs> yeah, nice backhanded compliment there. Yeah, it's like, your sound sucks, you know. Let, let's, let, let's start with that. Um, and you know, it, he, they had the little cassette players back then and he would, he would, uh, this was really painful. He would tape the gigs and then like listen to them and, and you know, that was, that's always painful. Um, but yeah, it made you realize, you know, to, 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 like Bruce said, to follow one of these guys, you know, just a burning solo, you, you really had to step up to the plate and, and, and deal and, and. And you know, have have good time, good feeling, good you know, bluesy bluesiness in your playing, and but be also be able to play tunes. And he had kind of cool arrangements. It was it was a great training ground. How how old were you then? I was seven. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Uh, I was. Uh, that's you know, but that's forty nine in dog years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, early 20s yeah so I, something like that was that a is that a long stint you get to you got to do with him or i lasted two years which was a pretty good long stint for for that gig um and then after that i we when we weren't on the road we had a steady four night a week gig at uh, dude's lounge in harlem uh four uh we played from 10 10 to four in the morning four wow. nights a week yeah and uh all these cats would come through there, like you know, uh, uh, Lonnie Smith, Jimmy Smith, uh, uh, Mick Groove, Mick uh, Jimmy, Groove yeah. Holmes, Jimmy McGriff. Yeah. You know, Charles uh, Lou, used to hang too, right? Huh? Charles Erland, he would. Yeah, hang. Lou Lou Donaldson. Um, but I that's I met Stanley Turrentine there, and uh, after I left Jack, uh, I ended up getting the gig with Stanley for about ten years. So. That was another really I'm super grateful to have had that experience. Well, you know, just hearing you say, oh, we had four nights a week and we're playing for that amount of hours, and now it's like one gig. People are just looking for one gig with the situation that we're all dealing with. People don't even have one gig anymore. Yeah, not even a gig. It's like, 
you zoom or you you yeah. teach or like man yeah. it, well it, this is this is really out what's going on right now yeah but, uh up till now it, yeah it was it was a different time and and uh i'm very glad that i got to to get in on it you know at the uh tail end of it kind of and get to play with some of those guys just like bruce did i mean there's no there's nothing like you know playing night after night with somebody like stanley turrentine who you can tell who it is in one note and you know super just everything he played laid and felt great and you know you it was inspiring you know you wanted to you wanted to come you know rise to that level and so it was a great way great way to learn that's that's kind of how i i learned how to play you know from listening to records and um kind of funny now because bruce and i are both professors <laughs> and uh <laughs> i don't think we ever thought that would be no no it just, i don't just, think that was ever in our kind of sounds strange to me you know it, yeah but it's kind of cool to since we did we did get that experience you know oh my to, god yeah it's to um, pass it on to try to pass it on a little bit what we we learned it's just such a it's like every time i hear you guys talk about that stuff now it just seems like a, a movie to me that 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 kind of thing existed <laughs> it feels such it, a, it would make a pretty good movie actually yeah. Yeah. yeah i know i mean i'm just thinking back of all the people i've played with you know and you know, and I'll, you know, I mean, I'm so lucky to have learned so much from, but I mean, just like, it's amazing, you know, yeah. I mean, these people who no longer, you know, these gods who once walked, I mean, it's like playing with these dinosaurs that were, you know, a hundred feet tall, you know. I, and, I can remember uh, hearing you with Bobby Hutcherson on, on some records and right. I mean, that's I one of my favorite here. musicians. That guy was, I mean, I think we talked about him last week. That guy is just, you know, I mean just another kind of human you know my my time with mcduff was different i did a tour in europe with him with jimmy cobb you wow. know the drum the drummer who's on kind of blue of course and, uh with miles all those years and it was a very it was like a strange thing i mean i guess we did a workshop all together and then somebody put a tour together you know we did this tour week or two and uh and and Jimmy and Jack didn't get along. You know, they just they had a different concept of where everything was supposed to be and the way it was supposed to be and the way a gig's supposed to go. And I was like this little white boy stuck in the middle of that. You know what I mean? Was there a horn player on the gig? No, no, it was trio. So wow. So it was like I was kind of like. You know, Jack would say, tell him to fucking do this, you know, and like, and Jimmy would say, tell him to fucking, they wouldn't talk to each other, you know, so <laughs> along, along with like, you know, all the shit I had to like interpret the, the, uh, I was the interpreter, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, it, it was still, it was so amazingly happening, but you know, I mean, Jimmy had just this idea of time being really finite and, you know, and Jack was kind of used to the, you know, the organism of it. And I thought it, it sounded great to me. And I was, you know, like a pig in shit, but, uh, they weren't getting along for most of the time. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember it was, you know, it was, it, it, it was like, it, if it was Monday and he yelled at the drummer and Tuesday, he yelled at the sax player you didn't want to be there on Wednesday if you were right. a guitar player. So, I mean, it was like clockwork. Mm -hmm. And nothing you did would matter because if it was Wednesday and it was your turn, you know, he was going to go completely off on you yeah. and screaming and, you know. Um, but it was, it was kind of what I dug about Jack was, you know, he would scream at you, but then uh, you would be cool uh you know, he wouldn't hold it. It would just, he got it out and then, you know, you'd go smoke up some pot or something and you'd be good. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, not that I condone that in any way. And, uh, oh, yeah. and I, and I did well, not. Well, it's enjoy. legal out here anyway. And, you never, you never, you never <laughs> exhaled, right? <laughs> uh, but the, um, yeah, you know, it's just some classic, uh, 
screaming matches and things like that. But you know, it was it uh, it was a great it was a great learning experience for me. And never never went to fist fisty cuffs. Uh, it was. I remember one time in Chicago. You know, he we were face to face, and and I was so mad, and he was like. Maybe you think because I'm a little guy, you know, blah, 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 I'll kick your mother ass. <laughs> and I and I'm just like just like got my my hand clenched, and I'm just like, Dave, don't be the guy that killed Jack McDuff. You know, you don't want that on your resume. It's like you know, that would just be bad. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad to be famous for that, right? I know, but th- then again, sometimes you know, if you were the guy that did. Do- that- you know, that decked him in Chicago, that would be like, you know, you were the guy that finally said you'd had enough, you know what I mean? And <laughs> you might, who knows, you know? Yeah. You don't want to kill him, but, you yeah. know. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I kind of miss those days. It, you know, I, when you're younger, you don't, you don't mind doing those long gigs and stuff, or I guess not as much as you would now, but, the thing is, you learn a lot of times from those guys th- good things, but also things not to do. So, like when you have a band or you're paying a band or you know taking a band out there, you remember things that you'd hated about you know that they would do money, you know itinerary, knowing the knowing where you're going, itineraries, these kind of things ahead of time. So, you know you when you remember what that felt like being you know unsure of what was happening you know uh, it makes you want to do you know do the right thing with your your band so you learn that way too yeah i can imagine a lot of good a lot of good stories i'm sure someone over the years probably took him out or decked him or hit him how could it not happen (laughs) yeah yeah the uh one time uh i'll never forget i might have told you this bruce but I was playing up at that place, Dude's Lounge, and I looked out in the crowd, and and uh, about ten feet away from me was George Benson sitting there. And I said, um, "If I get through tonight, I'll be good the rest of my life." You know, it's like I mean, it's it's like it's like Muhammad Ali sitting out there. You know, it's, right, yeah. and you're a fighter. It's like, um, and so he. Uh, he came up and played, and you know he had that mask, this masquerade. So I think I played on that, and he sang that, and then I handed him my guitar. Uh, I was playing an L five through that same little polytone, and uh, I'll never forget. I, I I sat down, and he didn't t- touch any knobs on the guitar or the amp, and he just started playing. And guess what? It sounded exactly like George Benson, <laughs> and I was like, oh. Maybe it's in the fingers, you know. Wow. Yeah. And it is. Um but that was that was real cool to to uh to get get through that, you know. Now nobody scares me, not even Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you know, I had Lord knows how many of those I've had. Shit, man, you know. You look up and boom, there's yeah. a guy, right? And yeah. what do you do? You know? You just got to keep playing, and then you go in the back and puke, you know. After right. The- I didn't think. Philly, I thought I was first, yeah. first gig in Philly. I was on the road with Richie Cole, and usually the band was a quintet. You know, we had a piano, and Richie and I would play all these lines together. That was kind of the sound of the band. Um, I guess for this tour, we didn't have a piano player until we got to New York. So we just did Philly and. Newark and Trenton and a few other places on the way to New York, you know, and I'm sitting there in Philly. I think it was a club called like stars. Was was there a club called, I think stars was the name of the club. And um, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm literally kind of slugging my way through the band because I'm kind of both the piano player and the guitar player, you know, trying to do my job and the job of the other cat. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like a, like a one, one, one arm wallpaper hanger dude, you know, kind of thing. And, um, God, within arm's reach, sitting at the bar, was Pat Martino. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I just looked at it and went, holy shit. You know? And I mean, I felt like I was, you know, flailing away anyway. So I just like, you know, the break, I put my guitar down and went to the dressing room, just hid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, there's like two seconds later, 
Richie's like, going, hey, Bruce, Pat wants to meet you. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> brings Pat in, and I'm like, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> yeah, that and happened to me, so too. Great. She was so great. I mean, we became good friends, you know. We're still good friends. And But what a gracious man, you know. He yeah. was so cool. Bruce, it was wonderful interacting. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's like this mystical uh yeah. guy. Like you know, yeah, that's what been one of the joys of my life too is this is a guy that I really really got me into jazz, you know. I mean, of course, guys like Wes and Grant Green and Kenny Burrell and all those guys. Uh but something about Pat's playing early on, you know, coming from rock and blues and stuff that fire that he has in his playing was was really got me into into jazz and and to this day i just i love his playing so much unfortunately he's not doing well right now but um but yeah that happened i was jimmy bruno called me one time to come down and play with him at uh chris's uh-huh. same and same thing and 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 i look over at the bar and five feet away there's pat with his wife and they stayed the whole night and and I'm like, you know, I'd be playing and I'd like, wait, don't play that one. Don't play that one. <laughs> don't play that one. <laughs> All the stuff I stole from Pat Martino. But, it, you know, it, at the end of the day, you just you just play yourself anyway. You know, you play, you hopefully you got your own sound. That's what we all strive for, to have our own, you know, our own sound and our our own thing. Everybody's unique. And... uh you know that's, but it it is it is uh, as guitar players that that is a uh, trial by fire you might say when you yeah, when you when you can really, get it's really good for you and we should and I kind of endeavor to play all the time even when I'm alone as if you know George Benson Pat Martino I can't tell you how many times Barney Kessel was like in the front row or Joe Pass you know when I was playing you know and I try to like be that in that headspace all the time. You know, smart. Yeah, it's just you know, it's the way we need to be. You know, I mean, play with conviction. Yeah, yeah. like you're, you know, you're, you're like, and you know, like they're looking because they are looking down on us. Yeah, I mean, they're we're standing on their shoulders on, on the one level, but on the other level, they're all observing us. You know, and and we need to like measure up to that every day. You know? Good, good words, man. I, I agree. You know, you you have to play with conviction and and play like you mean it. And when you play like you mean it, uh, people feel that whether they're you know whether they're jazz lovers or whatever or just normal civilians, uh, if you're playing with that conviction and and you know playing with with heart and like you mean it, um, that communicates to people. I think. Yeah. You're yeah. right. We can tell you right. I'm I'm getting a notice if I don't sign up. <laughs> if I don't sign up, less than a minute. I got less than a minute. Is that what it's telling us? Yeah, I see it says that, but I think well, we they've never they've never boxed us out before. <laughs> Guitar wank is didn't you, pay, you didn't pay the bill. <laughs> you should have paid the bill, Troy. <laughs> so, so we forgot, I forgot to pay the bill, and they're going to turn the. I don't know if they will or not. We've only been doing this four years, so we're learning. You know what I mean? Well, this this whole online. Normally, you, do you ever come to LA, Dave? I um, occasionally, yeah. I occasionally I've been out there. Uh, it's it's um, I used to come out and played at the Jazz Bakery, you know, a few mm-hmm. times. Yeah. And I uh, came out and played uh, uh, when she's now she's doing con.
We we planned that, Dave. Uh, I was I was was it something I said or something I played? <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to go to the bar, man. You know. What I mean? <laughs> I was just like, hey, let's plan it so when Dave's on, we'll we'll pretend we lose power and we have to cut yeah, him off. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's, it was a Corona thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Lucky, see, this is why we don't go live. <laughs> yeah, I forget what I was saying. I guess, yeah, but anyway, you're asking me if I ever come out to LA and um, uh, not occasionally. Yeah, occasionally, occasionally, yeah. yeah. Well, no, normally we do guitar wank here in the studio, and we, we you know, we'll sit around and have have a taste. It's, uh, right. What's that? We just get drunk, you know. Yeah. <laughs> totally ridiculous. That's. I mean, I, I'm sure our. Um, I'm sure our fans are, are our fan. I mean, is, is probably really disappointed <laughs> because usually we get all shit faced and say embarrassing things, you know. And now with the Zoom stuff, everybody's sitting in their house, you know, and being careful and shit. It's a little too, being, a little too safe. Yeah. 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 Well, I tried to watch my language, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, don't, don't, don't. Uh, f- fuck, no. fuck that, mate. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Hey. So, like, what really pisses you off about a drummer? What's the thing that pisses you off the most about drummers oh, when you boy. find yourself being pissed off about it? I'm lucky, you know. The, the I'm lucky to get to play with so many great drummers, but uh, you know, sometimes I'll hear. Uh, like if I if I'm doing like one of these workshops or something and I can't you know you get like a younger drummer and um, sometimes I'll say to them, "Have you ever done time?" And they'll and they'll look at you know they're 17 or something and they'll say, <clears throat> "I'm not sure what you mean." I, I said, "You know, have you ever been in prison?" And and uh, they'll say, <laughs> "No." By the way, I could just see them that night, you know, mom. Mr. Stryker was very scary. He scared me today. Um, but uh, I would say, well, they have, you know, chain gangs in prison. And, uh, you know, if you ever see one of those old movies, maybe, uh, they're over on the side of the road with pickaxes, you know, and, they, and they've and they got a uh, this big heavy weight, uh, you know, ball chained to their, to their uh, ankle. And I, I would say... That's kind of what it sounds like when you're playing. <laughs> In other words, it's like, you know, and then if they play like a funk beat or something, they sound good. It's like, look, just, you know, make it feel like that, you know? It's, yeah, so dragging drummers is a, is a, is a pet peeve for sure. Uh-huh. What about bass players? Uh, when are you trying to get me in trouble? <laughs> what do you, what about the left? I used to go to, you know, I used to go to the, um, I used to go to the organ player and I used to say to him, man, I'd like to buy the right hand drink. <laughs> <laughs> you're a lot left, of, pe- no, a lot of people that too much, you know, but I like your right hand. <laughs> a lot of people think that organ players uh, are playing, playing those bass lines with their foot. Yeah. Yeah, that's a misconception. They all play with their left hand. Yeah, uh, and that's why one of the reasons that org that the guitar sounds so good is because if you imagine the 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 you know they're kicking bass with their left hand. Now they will use the the pedals. The the good the the, the real organ players they use the pedals, but they're kind of like using it as an accent, or if if they're playing a ballad or an intro, they'll use it, or maybe a slower tempo, they'll double the bass line. Um, but so if if he's doing that with his left hand and his right hand is is soloing, that leaves that whole area there for the guitar player to fill up. That's why I think one of the reasons that it works so nicely, guitar and organ, as opposed uh, to piano. Piano, you have to really you know listen and work things out more. Um, so you know I think uh, what Bruce was saying earlier, it's kind of freaky what they can do because I've noticed Bruce, you can talk and play at the same time. I, I can't do that. I, I'm like, if I try, you know, or because you can sing and, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty much got to, got to just keep 
concentrate on what I'm doing with my hands or I get into yeah, big trouble. But, you know. But imagine I know. it started. It started early in my life. People were just talking to me when I was playing, and I would talk back to them. And you know, then then I'd be on a gig. You know, people come up to them, talk to me. Generally, they ask either where the bathroom is <laughs> or if I knew where they could hear some live music. <laughs> so I would have to tell them, you know, while I'm playing, you know, so I don't know. It's just always been easy for me to separate that. But. Yeah. If, but if you, if you, so take that, but then imagine if you were, uh, walking bass and walking here. bass over here on a, and then playing lines over here, it's just, you know, and then still like working all the draw bars in the every now and then. And, and kicking you know either the root or the fifth to punch the bass or doubling i mean and then the expression pedal is that's really what makes organ players to me when you hear a great organ player you know i mean yeah there's a lot of guys i mean there's a lot of piano players can walk left hand bass and play you know but there's that thing the way the expression pedal the right foot of the organ player mm-hmm. volume the pedal, way yeah. they can kind of give the lines that sort of immediacy and swell and attack there's a whole art i mean to me i think that's probably the most uh, they call it the expression pedal but i think that that's really like where you can really hear the difference in a lot of those cats because uh, fundamentally the instrument is sounds the same right i mean yeah play it but they all sound so different and i really think it comes down to the way they play that expression pedal yeah, there's so many. The other thing, yeah, is all this draw bar settings. There's, it's incredible. Yeah. Like, who, uh, you know, it it is a pretty wa- uh, amazing instrument for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I I don't have any good uh, bass player stories. Um, you know. Okay, so what do you hate about guitar players? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> What do I hate about guitar players? Yeah, yeah, you know. They rush, they play too loud. <laughs> they don't know any tunes. Uh they uh Oh, that's me. Sorry. Let's <laughs> <That's you. laughs> Well, we could talk about pedals. Yeah. <laughs> How I was that was not Or tuner or tuners. tuners. Yeah, right, right. That How was, many do you need on one guitar? That was my next question, Dave. Is what's show us your pedal board? What's what Well, you know, I uh I don't really use pedals <laughs> too much unless it's it's like a, a gig that I that I or a recording or something that I need some of that on. But you know, I use some reverb and a little delay to make it a little longer, but not uh you know, basically, I like the sound of you know. I think just the natural sound of the guitar is is more my thing, and but I appreciate guys that know how to do that. You know, it's 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 uh, to each their own. Um, Are you still using the mini brute? Uh, I actually record usually with a Fender tube amp, like a. I have this one. It's called a Fender Blues DeVille with four tens. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been using that for all, almost all my records. I have, you know, Twin. I have Deluxe. Uh, but I do have, uh, somehow I've I kind of collected a lot of polytones just because uh, <laughs> everybody seems to always have one for 200 or 250 bucks, you know, and I'm like, I'll take that. Okay. You never know. You know, I'll be the guy that, that'll have the poly, you know, when the... When the world ends and, you know, the uh, there's nothing, just all the buildings are gone and, you know, people are walking through the bricks and stuff, I'll still have my polytone on there. <laughs> you can have a stack, a polytone stack, man. <laughs> yeah. How many do well, you have? I think I have about seven of them. Oh, I'm, wow. You know, yeah, yeah, I really do. It's crazy. That's, I that's have a bunch of a problem. Out. I teach out at Indiana. I, got, I probably got three or four out there. I got a bunch here. But they, you know what? You plug into one of those ones with a 15, man, they sound good. They really do. They're, they're, they're decent amps, man. You know, a lot of these amps, uh, the small amps now, are, are kind of modeled after that sound. I think Henriksen is, is like, yeah. you know, they're, they're modeled after that kind of sound. Um, it was, I remember when I lived in North Hollywood, they had their uh, factory out there, right? What was his name? Tommy? Tommy Gamina. Tommy Gamina. Yeah. And he was, uh, he was an accordion player. Uh-huh. But uh, I think Joe Pass made him famous and ray brown um so they were it was funny though i always uh 
these amps, you know, I've had, you know, companies, we won't name them, uh, you know, ask me to endorse them. And I'll, and I'll say, you know, with a, for jazz guitar, you really just need maybe bass, treble, middle, volume, and a nice, um, couple nice selections for reverb. You're, and, you know, you'd be, that's all you'd need for most jazz guys. And so, you know, they send me the next amp and it's, it's got like more knobs on it. It's got like, you know, <laughs> it's just like, you know, five different uh, EQs and, you know, 20 different kinds of reverbs, including, you know, like rotary and what does this thing got? I yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, they could have made hundreds if they would have listened to me. Well, that, that I, DeVille, that's what... I think isn't that's what Michael Landau uses too, doesn't he? Didn't he do the, the Deville? Uh, he do a model with Fender. With was it with the Deville? Yeah, it's like the blues with the locks. Only yeah. it's got four speakers. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. was. It, I think it was before the. It was. It was. Uh, it was called the Blues Deville, and then they changed. They might have changed it to the the Blues Deluxes or whatever. But right. I think most of those guys in L.A. got the. Don't they have the $40,000 uh, boutique amps and stuff? Isn't that how they... Yeah. The Dumble? Yeah. yeah. Some of them do. I'm just joking, man. You know. Yeah, some do, some do. What would I know? You know? I remember go, they going to... I was talking to Pete Bernstein, and uh, I, the first time I heard him was... Uh, there was this, this concert, a Jim Hall tribute kind of concert at, at uh, Town Hall. And... Pete was just out of the new school, so he must have been about 20. And, and he just had a little polytone and playing through his uh, 175. He sounded great. Of course, Jim Hall sounded great. They all had little tiny amps. And about towards the end of the show, they say, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to bring out Pat Matheny. And, uh, and his roadie comes out and pushes this... Um, stack <laughs> i mean it, it was it was on wheels it was like it looked like this you know a garage like this a garage door it was just massive and uh you know he plugged into it and it kind of sounded like a polytone you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know man i i love pat though man pat is uh one of my favorites for sure of all time and uh but you know the he's got he's got a sound man so more power to him yeah but it was it was just a fun it was just a funny juxtaposition you know to see like jim hall and and pete bernstein and these guys playing you know with with their little tiny amps with a mic on it and and uh to see that come out it was like wow (laughs) yeah yeah that's always fun yeah, but that's, that's sort of like a version of the Segovia joke, right? You know, I mean, like, you know, he comes out with the big amp, right? You know, the huge amp, the roadie and everything. And they go, hey, Pat, you know, what? He says, you know, we noticed, like, Pete and Jim were playing, you know, and they just played with these little teeny amps, you know, and put a mic in front of it. And you came in and you brought, you know, had a roadie and you brought in all this stuff, you know, you know, and uh, Pat would go, yeah. The guy would go, well, what gives? And Pat would say, well, let's face it. Some people just don't give a shit. (laughs) 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 Do you remember remember when when I started, I um, took my first guitar lesson, and uh, the guy said, do you want to come to my combo practice? Like, I think, Bruce, you and I are probably similar to the same age. You're probably a lot older than me, actually. Yeah. Um, no. Um, but when they talk about garage bands, I can remember, like, in Omaha, like, going in my neighborhood, and they would open up the garage, and there would be a band in there playing. And they'd be playing Louie Luai. And, uh, you know, I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. So, like, I, I'm taking lessons from my first teacher, and he says, uh, do you want to come to... We're having a combo practice, you know, down in the basement, you know, down the street. I said, yeah, man, I want to go. So he takes me to the combo practice, and I we go down in the basement, and they had red custom amps. Do you oh, know? man, the tuck and roll. The, the tuck and roll, and they were, but they had, like, 
all red custom amps, and I thought that was about the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Wow. Um, purple too, right? Red sparkle, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, with the little silver holes in it. And, um, you know, I think one of the fathers or something had, you know, was a plumber or something and probably mortgaged his house to go buy all this stuff, you know, all, the, all these red custom amps. But um, just anyway, it was... Those, those kind of memories are, are you were cool. hooked there were you hooked. and and bruce and go-go dancer <laughs> go-go dancer? they had a go-go dancer holy shit man now that's what we need i think that's what music needs i think we need to to think uh, about yeah, that. i mean we've had that in over the over the past years you know what i mean so yeah i i Let's think bring we it back a, to jazz i think we need a scoreboard and a referee that too I mean, I think I think as soon as it, it, we can get the sports thing going, it seems more competitive, and people can bet on what we do. I think it, it, people will enjoy it, and it will get a lot more popular. Yeah, but and just, they'll cover it like on the nightly news, you know, like the news, weather, sports, and jazz, you know, and like who won today, and who's going to make the playoffs, and who got traded to who, and we need that kind of thing going, you know. Maybe. Or maybe combine it with roller roller derby. Yeah, <laughs> with numbers on them and shit. You know, that, 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 I'd, that, I'd I'd do that. I'd watch that. That'd be great. Shot clock, maybe. You know, that, what I mean? that movie came on the other night. You know, my oh, I, my right. wife wouldn't let me watch it. She, you know, she, she doesn't like to watch any violence and stuff. But uh, do you remember that one? It was out. Roller ball. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, the. Just to, the, something funny about the custom amp. So when I got the gig many years later with Jack McDuff, what do you suppose his PA system was? <laughs> oh, that's great. Black, a black custom PA. Black custom. Man. Wow. It's like, it like oh, who knew? And, and you had to help carry it, of course. Like with well, the, the organ and shit. let's not even talk about moving those B3s. Yeah. You know, showing up at a... Oh, the elevator's not working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What what uh, what guitar is the main X these days? I've been playing a, a Gibson uh, ES three forty seven for a long time. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and uh, just and. Uh, I like it. I, I, I was playing uh, with, with Jack. I played an L5, and I still have it. Um, but uh, I don't know. When I started breaking records and stuff, I kind of liked the sound of this. It, the, this particular guitar, um, the pickups are, I think they're called Dirty Fingers or something. They're like super like punchy. So if you try to play this guitar through a small Fender amp and, and you hit a chord, you know, it's sounds like eddie van halen or something <laughs> so we, what kind of tailpiece is going i mean it seems like the tailpiece is different i can't really tell i am not supposed to, i can't tell you but you know that's tough oh, okay. okay um too, this too is nerdy a, i know but it, it's just hidden or no. no this is um this guitar came out it had those little um in the history of you know useless things little screws down here to tune it uh-huh yeah, you know, like the micro tuners they called it. Yeah, 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 like on a on a violin. Yeah. And uh, no one uses that, man. Yeah. Or maybe I sh maybe I should. Then I would be like playing tune. That would. That well, maybe. you know, yeah. But, why, uh, why start now? Why start now? Yeah. Um, as Joe Pass said, you know, I spent half my life tuning up, and the other half playing out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. Um, so I took out the screws, and it's like the gold hardware here. But when I play, uh, I rest my arm right here. And so I wore all the gold off from sweating on it. And then I would start to get a, a rash on my arm from, uh, like, bad jewelry. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And so I said, had my guy build um, this little, pla uh, I don't know what it is, plastic or something. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, he, and put that on over it. And it is the uh, the number one most asked question uh, by guitar players. And that's what a is, ES. What is that? What is it? What model is it? Three forty seven. So what's the I difference? It didn't have a baritone or anything, did it? What's that? It didn't have that baritone switch on it, did it? It's got a toggle switch, right? 
It has, um, the difference is it has a uh, ebony fingerboard from a 335. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, these pickups are super punchy. They're, they're, uh, I think they're called dirty fingers. And, um, but it doesn't have a veritone switch on it. It right? has a split coil. Okay. It has that, but. And that's you, all. Uh, no, it, it doesn't, doesn't have, have like the BB. Five, five yeah, that's switch. like the BB King. No, it doesn't have that. Oh, okay. So, um, and I got three of these, so I, I like them. Whoa. I made almost all my records with that. And, but I, this, this is my, uh. This is my pandemic guitar I bought myself here. Uh oh. Uh oh. What'd you do? <laughs> what'd you do? Yeah, hopefully you won't your wife won't sell it for what you told her you paid for it. I got a good deal on it. But this is a, a nineteen fifty six uh, one twenty five. Oh wow. great. Yeah. It's, it's older than me. Nice. And um, it's got a really sweet tone. Um I just before all this happened, I I bought it, and so I've been playing this a lot. I I always oh, every yeah. time I heard somebody play one of these, I dug it. It's just got a nice sweet tone with it. it's got the one P ninety on it. Yeah, and uh, I've got this. Uh, this is a Benedetto. That's really nice. This is a oh. uh, like a three like their version of a three thirty five. They're uh, th this is they make really nice instruments. There I notice right away that that you hear. Um, every note when you play a chord, yeah, more than on uh, the Gibsons. The Gibsons are a little, um, but there's something about you know, like when you play a guitar for 30 years, you know, it's just got some mojo to it, like that 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 Gibson of mine. So, I, I it's hard for me to to change up. Uh, but this one is, um, they had to stop making this at Benedetto because of Gibson. Uh, this, oh, this, threatening them. Yeah. Th yeah, threatening all these companies because of the shape. Right. Um, but that's a nice axe. And uh, I got a whole bunch. I got, still got my L5 and 175. And I love that guitar of yours. What is that, Bruce? That red one? Oh, that's a, it's a Stefan Sontag. So that's, uh, he's a maker in Germany. Um, he's made a lot of guitars for a lot of people. It's it's r really acoustic, you know. It's like a super acoustic. Uh, when when you play uh, those uh, videos, like the um, the first course of the day or whatever, yeah. are you plugged in or no? Yes, I you, you're hearing kind of a blend of the amp in the room and the acoustic. Yeah, it sounds very and, acoustic. And it depends on like how I have it blended. Some days it sounds like it's all acoustic, and some days you can really hear the amp pretty well. Mm -hmm. What kind of capo do you use? Well, you know, it's my first finger. I really? was gonna use, I was going to use that, but then you know, it cuts down on how many fingers you have on the other side. Because you know? <laughs> this one gets kind of like not much happens when you use it. You use it. And your pedal board uh, is it out of the, it's out of the frame right now? I... Yeah, yeah, no, it's the accelerator and the brake. They're uh, they're actually uh, <laughs> they're parked in the garage right now. <laughs> <laughs> I might be the first guy you ever had on here that was. Uh... That didn't have a pedal board. Yeah, right. You know, Bruce. Yeah, you know, man. You know, yeah. I'm I'm like the worst guy to ask about gear, but but I get so many questions about it. You know, I mean, you you teach somebody and you watch somebody struggle with it. And you go, well, this is called treble. It makes <laughs> the eyes come out. This is called bass. It makes the lows come out. But don't get fooled. Sometimes there's a lot of low and highs and a lot of high and lows. <laughs> you know, I. Uh... We we all a lot of times we jazz guitar players we suffer from the the Pat Martino disease you know of you oh know. man <laughs> yeah I remember I was playing with Stanley at, in uh, in San Francisco at Ivy's one time and and Jimmy Smith and his wife were there and and uh, I come I come come off stage he goes uh, Jimmy Smith says you sound good but you're down in the mud. <laughs> of course, you know. Imagine, imagine the amp they had, uh, jazz chorus. Every every gig back then, nowhere right. it, it was yeah. a jazz chorus with two twelves. Right. The worst right. amp of all time, I think. Right. You know, I was at Dizzy's. Uh, I played there. I guess a couple years ago. The first time I played there, and uh, I went in there, and they the the the, the guy uh, brought it out. You know. Here's our amp, and it's like this jazz chorus. And I looked at him. I said, "This is fucking jazz at Lincoln Center, right?" <laughs> I know. Said, yeah. And I said, "How many people have ever said to you, 
oh great that's <laughs> for us he says have you i said have you ever heard that sentence before and he said no <laughs> I said, I'm gonna, you guys are a nonprofit, right? He said, yeah. I said, I'm going to take care of you. So I called my friend who's like the vice president of Fender, you know? Uh-huh. I said, these guys need an amp. You know, get them a twin or a deluxe. So get them something, you know? And so I put them together. And now there's a twin at uh, at Dizzy's to use. Yeah. Because, I, hope it's, I hope it's not the one with the red knobs. No, no, it's the black face. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Remember the Fender Twin with the red knobs? Yeah, but I'd still yeah. prefer I prefer that to a jazz chorus. <laughs> well, if you're playing with the Stratocaster and you're playing a, f- a funk gig and you put on the chorus on a jazz chorus, you know, you're in good yeah, you shape. You sound like Pat Metheny. But if you, well, I don't know about that, but you, uh, if you, uh, I don't know. So it seems like maybe sometimes the jazz chorus can can sound okay, but yeah, oh no, I've had I've had okay experiences with them, but I was never happy to see one. I got to be honest. Yeah, but yeah, Jimmy Smith's uh, that was his comment. So I always tell I always say tell my students, you know, if you're talking about you know getting sound, I say always make it a little treblier than you think it should sound where you're standing, exactly. Exactly. and it's gonna it's gonna sound great out there. But right. if you if you try to make it like sound the way you know. You're gonna just, you're just gonna always sound like you're down in the mud, as Jimmy Smith told me. Right, it travels the first thing that kind of falls off the sound as it moves through the room. You know, right? Yeah. Make it brighter than you than you think you need to be, and you'll be in good shape. Yeah. You you never went the Strat or the Tele, played with those I those guitars. I do, yeah, yeah. If, depending on what the gig was, of you know, I mean, I've. Uh, I've played my fair share of uh, weddings, you know, throughout, you know, it, it, whatever you, you need to do to make the, to pay your rent. And, you know, I got, I managed to uh, bring up a family. I got two old sons in their late 20s. So, you know, I was, yeah, if I was doing like a, a, pop, a pop gig or a wedding or whatever, I'd, I would, uh, I would uh, play, a, I have a, I still have a black uh strat yeah but uh, i'm a big guy so i th- i need a bit little bit bigger looking guitar it kind of looks like a toy some of those you know do the kids play i'm a i'm a i'm a full figure jazz guitar <laughs> do, do the do the kids play no uh they're into they're both film into film oh wow that's yeah. cool and very they're talented and uh one's in la yeah uh in glendale and uh the other one's in austin and uh yeah so i mean uh yeah i've always felt you know I, even when i go back to there's some amazing youtubes of like jim hall with that 175 um just it says something about uh, the natural sound of the guitar like that is to me uh, it's and, and it uh I'm glad that on a lot of the records I did all through the, I started recording, like, I think my first record was in 88 and then like all through the nineties that I didn't like go for the, the sound that was kind of popular, you know, with the chorus and all that doesn't age that well. No, that's got I be- always, I always kind of thought of, you know, like I wanted to sound like a tenor player or something, you know, and, and just, and just get a nice rich sound and, and, uh, and that sound, you know, I think that that has it ages. It ages better. I think I don't think there's a guitar sound that is dated so badly as that eighty nineties chorusy sound. I remember when I was in L.A. that uh, that that right when that chorus came out that yeah, they had basic, that. To remember that it was a yellow. It was a yellow one. I remember it was like a yellow box that was a chorus, and man. Yeah, remember the orange one before it, the phase shifter? Yo, hell yeah, I got one right now. Uh, yeah, that that was another one that kind of quickly <clears throat> aged its way out. You know, I mean, I was in L.A., what, in the late 70s myself. Let me think, was it, had I moved to, no, I hadn't moved to New York yet. Yeah, late 70s, I don't know, mid-70s. And... You know, I was kind of trying my hand at the fusion thing. I got a 335, and I was playing with a bunch of bands, you know. And 
I just, just, you know, I didn't like it as much as playing straight ahead. You know what I mean? It was great music. God, the musicians I was playing with were great. You know, it was obviously way more popular, you know. And um, shit, uh, I was with, but at the same time, I was with Richie and Colin, Eddie Jefferson. He was in the, you know, they were doing that thing. And Eddie got murdered. And I just like that day, I realized, I said, shit, man, it can end any day. I'm going to play what I want to play. Right. I had L5. I love the way that felt. I love the music I played on it. You know, I love the scene I was in when I was playing it. The 335 just felt, I mean, when I heard Robin Ford do it, I, or Larry Carlton do it, I thought it was great. You know, I'm, I had all those records. I, I mean, it wasn't like I didn't dig it. It's just like when I went to play, it just, it, it was, I felt like I was faking. Like I was doing it for the wrong reason, you know? Yeah. And I just kind of never looked back, you know, really. I was, they, some guys make fun of me because I was, you know, I was one of the few guys that when you step on the distortion pedal, you know, yeah. I would get softer. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, 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 you know, it's like, oops, I guess that knob's supposed to be, you know, turn it a little bit more. Um, yeah, but I, I, I definitely went through that whole time. And, you know, other guys are a lot better at getting sounds like that than me. Um, so let them do it. I mean, I, I, whatever, man, if it, whatever makes you happy and it's, yeah, do it. I just, I just think, um, you know, I want to sound like a tenor player, you know, I think that that's, you know, just have a nice sound, man. Yeah. Yeah. And be, and you know, I mean, also, you know, I mean the classic jazz guitar, you know, it's, very mid rangey oftentimes muffly, you know, to get that fat sound. But then, you know, I mean, a lot of my, my, so many of my gigs were basically being the piano player in the band, you know, the right. comper, chordal. And it's like that sound, you sometimes, you just can't even hear what notes you're playing inside a chord. So that's why I've always kind of gravitated more to a brighter, sound just so i can hear the notes inside of voices you know what yeah I mean? um i actually dig though playing the i i played with a group had a group of steve slagel for many years uh where it was just guitar sax bass and drums and i love being the the soul the harmonic uh instrument <laughs> something real nice about i mean it's good to play with piano but i feel like when i play with a piano player a lot of times that i become more of a horn player and just kind of pick my spots you know you don't want to like um you know right you don't want to overcome no, nobody wants to hear all the clashing comping going on you know right right and you know a guitar has a lot of brightness in it. i mean you can yeah. hear a lot of treble in that sound you know i mean it's not all dark what chord? Is, what chord is that? Uh, it's it's an E suspended. <laughs> yeah, suspone. Yeah, you know. Yeah, E well, seven suspended. Well, you, you must have been pushing the brute back then to keep up with the the volume, right? Uh, are you talking about with the uh, when I was playing with Jack? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think they put a mic on it. You know. Oh right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes some clubs would have a a twin or something, but, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I still like the, 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 the polytones, but, uh, they're notorious for not working. And that's something that you kind of always hope, you know, when you're on a gig that things work. Yeah. That's not, it's, it's, it's not a lot to ask, but I mean, it's, it seems to be sometimes the way it is though, you know? Yeah. I remember Jack McDuff told me one time, he said, Stryker, if it ain't broke, it ain't mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, God, every organ gig I've done, the organ player was in there with like a a, a nine-volt battery shocking the motor. Or like there's the there's so the many wires, you can't so even like imagine. Chewing gum on some mass connection or, you know, just like, yeah. it was it was endless to see what these guys would do, you know, to keep these things alive. Yeah. Yep. Damn. So, so Dave, what are you doing these days? Well, obviously things have changed quite a bit, but normally is it you teaching gig? Have you got that? Or well, I've been uh, 
I've, it's things have been going really pretty uh, pretty nicely you know the last few years I've been playing more and more with my own group and uh, traveling around and um, at the beginning as Bruce mentioned I had a I, I did this project called eight track where I take tunes from the the 70s and I kind of jazzed them up put my own stamp on them and uh, people you know would tunes by you know Marvin Gaye or Stevie Wonder or uh, Curtis Mayfield, whatever, and people kind of dug that, you know, because they they recognized the melodies of these tunes they knew, and and uh, so that 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 last last summer I had a a number one record for a while with uh, uh, eight track three, and you know, I mean, I would on the gigs I would mix in some of that tune with my own tunes, and I still like to play standards and play around New York playing you know with different people and um go over to europe and italy and different places so th you know things were were going good uh and in the last few years i've been teaching at uh, a couple of universities uh at indiana university i've been out there now this is my coming up on my eighth year wow. i would travel out there every other week and uh, for a few days um and it was nice um and i also montclair state university here in uh in New Jersey, and uh, recently I just took over uh, for Vic Juris uh, to teach. Uh, I'm now the guitar guy at uh, Rutgers. So <coughs> I it was, you know, a lot of. Um, uh, and now because of what's happened with uh, the gig situation, and I'm, I talked to we, Bruce and I were talking about this. We're I'm, we're grateful that we have the the teaching thing now because. Uh, I don't know when the it's going to take a while I think for this to these gigs to start happening again it's it's pretty uncertain times you know before you guys you know it was hard to get people out the gigs now in the future there may no be no more people left <laughs> so yeah everyone might die off and then it'll be well, like we're, we're, as musicians we're like cockroaches now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go That'll be good. It'll be just like the old days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but are you, are you teaching all those schools online, Dave? Are you yeah, I finished out this last uh, semester, like you did probably, uh, all online. And does it look like you're going to do that again for the first semester? Uh, it's probably going to be a combination. I I think we're all waiting to see what's going to happen. And uh, isn't that the truth, right? Mm, <laughs> you're right. Uh, so many things can happen in the next month that'll change the game. Yeah. I know, and uh, but you know, I'm glad we have music because music it can be a positive force. You know, it can. I, I got I just put out this record uh, that I did with uh, in Cologne, Germany, with the WDR big band, uh, and Bob Mincer arranged all the music, and you know, I was it was already paid for and in the pipeline to come out and then this all hit and i was like well, should i just bag it you know and wait a year and i said what the hell you know yeah. people are sit sitting around
Yeah, there's always so much to do with music, man. It never ends. Yeah, it's never crazy. ends. You know, I'm uh, I'm grateful to very grateful to have this this music, man, and uh, appreciate you guys. You know, invite me on here to <laughs> shoot the shit for a while. Are shoot you are you playing more at at because of everything going on, or playing less? Uh, well. More like you getting to spend more time on your instrument just for yourself now, or you know, it's yeah. There's definitely you know having all this time has been good, but you know also trying to use it right. You know, yeah. Uh, we ended up getting a a puppy, <laughs> <laughs> so I got my hands full with you, her. Yeah, right. Um, but uh, you know, it's it is strange. You know, I mean, it was we. You know, that's we've always played music and ton gigs and and uh so they kind of pulled the rug out there literally and um so that jesus christ It's coming. Okay, okay. We'll just say goodbye. What happened? Usually we could like extend it. They usually extend it, but I guess because we've used it a bit, they didn't. Ah. Uh, Bastards. Okay, maybe they're maybe they're listening. You know, you just said it great. Yeah. Okay. Oh boy. That's like you know what it is. I we need I'm. We need it's um. We need to. Uh, I'm trying to keep it vintage in a little way. This is like if if it keeps cutting out, this almost gives it a vintage vibe. Well, Bruce and I are, you know, <laughs> Bruce and I are pretty vintage. Well, you know, I mean, you know, we're just going to have to pay more, I guess. But uh, wow, turn the lights on. Yeah. Right. Unbelievable. Yeah. But so, yeah, here we are. We got to figure out. We got to make use of this time because you know, this is it. This is the time we got, and we're jazz musicians, and we have to make up. These are the changes we got, right? Somebody says, okay, I got this tune. You're locked in your house for three, no, no gigs. Make it up. What are you going to do, you know? It's no different than being on a gig and have somebody else play some weird changes on some other tune, you know, or have some strange sound you got to deal with or, you know, whatever, weird directions to a gig. I mean... We're, we're jazz musicians. This is our job. We're supposed to figure this shit out. And if it means getting our solo thing together, if it means writing more music, coming up with a new way to present it to people, that's what, that's really what this is about, right? Yeah. I mean, And don't get sick. You know, we, 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 we like to pride <laughs> yeah. ourselves as being the creative ones. You're right. Time to prove it. Mm. Well, that's inspiring words, Bruce. And... Uh, even though they are full of shit. <laughs> no, it's, it's, you're exactly right. And, uh, you know, the uncertainty that's out there, you know, we just got to try to stay positive, man, and be, be grateful for uh, that we have this outlet of music, you know, to yeah. share. You know, it's, it's, uh, it will see what happens. Right. Dave, where does, where does everyone find your stuff? Where do we get your albums? Where do we, where do we lock into? Dave Stryker. Uh, I have a website, you know, davestryker.com. You can get everything there. I also have a band camp, uh, davestryker.bandcamp.com that has all my stuff. And uh, I've actually put, 
I resisted uh, putting my stuff up on Spotify. I have up my own label for the last ten years, um, and uh, but I decided. My son told me you got to put it on Spotify. That's how everybody's listening to music now. So, so I, I uh, the last uh, the new records, uh, Paul Blue Soul, it's on Spotify. And uh, I've been making a lot of point oh 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 seven <laughs> since. Um, well, meanwhile, the Spotify CEO is uh, on a yacht in the back of the Bahamas. Right. He's not yeah. worried about coronavirus. Yeah, it's fucking unbelievable. Except for he's drinking too much Corona. Right. You know? I was trying to, you know, I thought maybe by holding my music off of Spotify, I might sink him, but it. Apparently that didn't work. You know, they seem to be doing okay without uh, my yeah. product. Uh, you know, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> you never, you never know. Oh, man. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I wish it was. I wish it was under better circumstances. How we're all getting together, but um, yeah. I really I, appreciate this, man. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Dave, thank you. We played a tune with you. We played Stable Mates. Are you gonna? Put that well. Maybe it'll even be out before this comes out. You know. Yeah, um, we played it. We got a somebody. One of my students is supposed to be putting a little. Uh, oh, we God. call it. We call it a snippet. A is, snippet. It, is, is it? Is it? Is it? Did it work? I mean, is it possible to merge them? It's a snoop. It's a snoop. It's a snippet. So you'll. It, I'd you'll, rather snoop it. <laughs> snoop doggy snippet. Um, anyway. Uh, We'll do some more, Bruce. And yeah, that'd be good. Say anytime, man, and send me some more for this for the TV show. You know, we'll do. You and be a recurring guest. You know, Troy. I mean? Troy, good to meet you, man, and uh, thanks for uh, having me on, you guys. Dave, it was an absolute pleasure, mate. Make sure you go to DaveStriker dot com. Check it out. And uh, you don't do any lessons online, right? You you, you got to go to school. Uh, actually, to I, have a, I have a I have a online site at artistworks dot com. Oh, oh, okay, good. cool. Yeah, yeah, yep. And uh, so check me out there. Awesome. Okay, man. Well, thanks. Keep swinging, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. All right, man. Take care. See you, mate. Bye-bye.